it's much easier to retreat to the safety of your tribe where your tribe puts their arm around you and says, you're safe here. You don't have to come face to face with what you did. Instead, just understand as long as we're owning the libs, we're in this together. And people like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney mm -hmm. and Charlie Sykes, they make you feel bad, not because you deserve it, because they're bad. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday, and somehow, Adam Kinzinger, we've made it through, we've made it to December. It is December 1st. I don't believe it. I mean, I'm just, I'm struggling <laughs> with, uh, this has been a year. But the thing that makes me happy, even after all this year, is like, did I bump Tim Miller today? Because if I did, uh, that's my, my November is complete and December's off to a good start. Well, okay. So um, there, there's an achievement. By the way, congratulations on your book making the New York Times bestseller list. Um, nice. Actually, if, if, if people can see behind me here on YouTube, I have your book um, over here, um, Renegade. Yeah. And Liz Cheney's book comes out next week. And obviously, I think that's going to be a big bestseller. And these voices in the wilderness at least are going to be heard for a while again. So where should we start today? You know, in my <laughs> newsletter, I, I I kind of devoted it to the, the case that I don't think people are sufficiently alarmed yet. And I know that's yeah. like, oh, come on, that's all you guys do. And I say, no, no, I really don't think that people realize how dangerous this is. But, but I... I, I had to sort of back in with some palate cleansers, and I know you've commented on all of this, and you know, and I'm, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily proud of myself, but the story out of Florida. I mean, come on, I mean, I mean, really, <laughs> this woman telling cops that she and <laughs> the chairman of the Florida Republican Party, Christian Ziegler, along with Ziegler's wife, who is a co-founder of Moms for Liberty had been in a long-standing consensual three-way sexual relationship prior to the incident that is now being investigated as sexual assault. I mean, it's never they, the ones I you think, expect, you know? I think Moms for Liberty, like, I don't know much about them. I think they hate LGBTQ stuff. Like, they're... that Charlie, mm -hmm. it is always these people. Liberty, I man. mean, it's Liberty. always... Yeah, <laughs> it's always these people. Like, what... Honestly, of the... Last 10 politicians to be arrested for child sex crimes. I think all of them have been Republicans, at least nine out of 10. This thing, I mean, it is always these people. And I, I think there's got to be, you know, we could probably devote an hour to this, so I won't go too yeah. deep into this rabbit hole. But there's something weird about this, like, celebrity culture of Trump, where it's like people that, I guess, wanted to go to Hollywood that kind of grew up like thinking those parties and everything were awesome and they couldn't make it right. Cause right. very few people can, yeah. but they saw that they could like make dork Hollywood at Mar-a-Lago. And so they're kind of like living out their biggest dreams. And I don't know, I, there's just something broken in that yeah. whole system. Well, there's right something now. broken. And, but it's also the sense that, Hey, you know, the rules don't apply to us anymore. I mean, this is one of the right? things that Donald Trump, this is the great gift that he's given, right? That you can shelter under the wings of his complete amorality. And so I was actually, in, on, on a panel with a young Republican who was explaining that the thing about the Republican Party was um, that would attracted him was its belief in traditional values and and the nuclear family. And I'm thinking, OK, Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, this yeah. guy, we could go through it. OK, so what else do we have? I don't know. Did you watch the DeSantis Newsom um, undercard I undercard debate last night? I'm sorry. No, I got I got I some top lines of it, but yeah, I I yeah. was I first off, I honestly this is going to sound maybe petty, but I just I don't want to ever tune in Fox News anymore. I just okay. can't do it. I, I don't want to be yeah. checked on the rating scale. Yeah, no, I, I I didn't want to because I I just didn't want to. I but I right. did like uh, Politico's take. The debate between Ron DeSantis and Gavin Newsom was a big mess. There was even some poop. Fox News moderator <laughs> Sean Hannity did not help clean things up. That's kind of all I want to know. I mean, really I'm <laughs> That's moving it. on. So Although um, I like the Ron Ron uh, Filipkowski always does his like uh, uh, Ron DeSantis awkward yeah. smiles, so he's been posting yeah. a couple of those. So I've I've enjoyed that. Yeah, there were there were there were some moments, but you know, life 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 is short. Um, we also got a new uh, a story about uh, the new uh, Normie Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, your former colleague uh, Mike Johnson, who apparently wrote the forward for a book filled with conspiracy theories and homophobic insults. Who knew? Um, this is Shocking. written by the book is written by 
Scott McKay, a local Louisiana pl- uh, politics blogger, it's called The Revivalist Manifesto, gives credence to unfounded conspiracy theories often embraced by the far right, including the Pizzagate hoax, which falsely claimed top Democratic officials were involved in a pedophile ring, among other conspiracies. <laughs> this uh, caught my eye. The book also propagates baseless and inaccurate claims, implying that Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts was subjected to blackmail and connected to the disgraced underage sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. So Mike Johnson um, continues to impress with his willingness to go down every rabbit hole of crazy. And every Republican in the House voted to make him speaker second in line to the presidency. Yeah, it's 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 frightening. It's dangerous because, look, if this was a one off, like, he, you know, I mean, I never would do a forward to any book as a congressman, but, you know, you'd get asked to. And I could see I could give him a one off where it's like, oh, no, I knew the guy. I, I didn't read the book. Yeah. I, I did it as a favor. Fine. Yeah. But the problem is this is consistent. And I know and I talked about this a lot in Renegade, which is I know what this kind of culture is. You had Dave, uh, Dave French on this week and mm-hmm. uh, or last week, and he was really good. He understands like I understand kind of that evangelical move because we were raised in it. and I will tell you, it is rife, not the good evangelical. There are good evangelicals left. But if you look at the crazy stuff that's like infecting Florida that we see all over, they believe these conspiracy theories because it feeds into this, as as David French called it, this prophecy narrative. But this like good against evil that if somebody says, yeah, John Roberts was part of, you know, the Epstein Island thing, it, it. it's believable because your default setting as this kind of evangelical is that humanity is naturally evil. And so all this thing must be true and, and Satan controls everything. And so it's frightening because Mike Johnson appear. Let's be honest. He comes across so well. He's out of central casting yeah, in terms of speaker of the house. And so people, when you talk about him being crazy, it's, you can see him as a conservative. Yeah. It's hard to see him as the crazy that he frankly is. No, I, you have to do that, uh, that deep dive into him. Okay, so uh, speaking of the House, but before we move on to the, the more substantive things, um, mm-hmm. Kevin McCarthy uh, continues to go through some things. I, I am absolutely fascinated by some of the recent stories we've had, in, including his, he continues to be absolutely obsessed, and I guess maybe this is where the blind squirrel mm-hmm. gets the, the nut once in a while, obsessed with how much he hates Matt Gates. I mean, so yeah. there, there's that. So what do you make of the fact that <laughs> Kevin McCarthy, and I have a couple of things I want to bounce off you, that uh, Kevin McCarthy apparently had a phone call with Donald Trump after he was ousted as speaker. And we all remember that uh, Kevin McCarthy had bailed out Donald Trump at one of the low points of his political <laughs> career, actually began the comeback uh, when he you know, did the whole Mar-a-Lago thing, which I want to talk about in, in, in a moment. <laughs> And apparently he called up uh, Trump and said, you know, what the hell? Why didn't you lift a finger for me? And Trump apparently said, well, you didn't expunge my two impeachments and you didn't endorse me. And and apparently Kevin McCarthy is going around telling friends that he then said, fuck you to Donald Trump. What do you think? Do you think he said it or think he's saying he said it? I don't know. You know, honestly. OK, so I'll tell you. Just to be fair on Kevin, which I never am, so I will, yeah, I will, right. I will make an exception. He, there is a couple times he can use anger effectively. So mm-hmm. this was back in maybe fourteen or fifteen. There was some issue. I was talking to Kevin about I was going to vote the other way from the party, and uh, you know he's Mister Nice Guy Smiley McGee, and he actually showed a flash of anger, and I thought that was effective. So I think there is part of him, and I also think that given how he has debased himself so much, I mean you see it in when he shoulder checked me on the floor of the house. And then when he elbowed the dude from Mm -hmm. Tennessee, you're starting to see like this internal, I basically am in a bad place emotionally, you know, socially, emotionally, I guess it, that's all building up in him and it's exploding. And so I think it's possible he did say this to Trump, but let me say, Charlie, I also think it's just as likely. And I know this isn't the answer you're looking for. It's Mm -hmm. just as likely that he made it all up. Yeah, because no. what what Kevin does is he tells whoever he's talking to right. what he needs to tell. I mean, back when I was in Congress and, you know, in the middle of my of my career, when we were trying to take on the crazy caucus, the Freedom Club, he would come into me and be like, yeah, I mean, Adam, I'm doing this because we got to take them on. And I know for a fact then he went and told the crazy club, you have people like Adam, the moderates that are trying to harangue me. He tells he tells Liz Cheney he has to go down. And spoon feed the president of the United States, which is the funniest 
I love this story, by the way. I I love this story. Okay, so so what do you make of that story that he's telling people? Well, that he told Liz Cheney, I went down to Mar-a-Lago because they called and said he was depressed and he wasn't eating and I just had to be there to sit by his bedside. Okay, this is clearly complete bullshit, right? But yes, but but apparently he 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 thought this was going to be the plausible explanation. You know, (laughs) yes, I'm I'm not so I'm not a craven coward. Um, I, I was actually there on a, on a mission of mercy to Mar-a-Lago. I got to go feed the president. Listen, the merciful Kevin McCarthy. We, you know, when, when Liz says in her, the excerpts of her book about like, uh, what was it? She said, you know, I thought the picture was fake. We all did. We were all on a text oh, really? chain actually of the, uh, of the voter, the voters, the impeachers. Yeah. We were all on a text chain and we sent that picture out and it's like, and I don't, so Liz evidently saves her text forever. Just so you guys know. Like mine delete in 30 days. That's mm. a good thing. It's also a bad thing because I don't have text to share in my book. But yeah. I do remember she sent a text that or one of us sent the, the picture and it took us time. Somebody had to reach out to Kevin to see if it was real. Kevin told it wasn't me. Somebody else on her text chain, Jamie Herrera Butler mm. or something like that, had said, oh, I was down there fundraising with some big donors. And the former president invited me over and you have to stop and see the former president. That was his explanation to them. So then Liz calls and evidently he knows that that's not going to fly with Liz. So that turns into Kevin is just this loving person. Frankly, don't feed the president. We wouldn't be in this position if you wouldn't have fed the former president for God's sakes, but instead he's sitting here spooning him out. I got a two year old kid and I'm, I'm, and Kevin wants us to believe that he basically went and, you know, stirred his cereal up while he was throwing a fit. Incredible. Okay. So speaking of some of the things in, in Liz Cheney's book, we're not going to spend the whole time on all this. So I'm not, hopefully we're going to be talking with her on the podcast next week. Good. But um, from the New York Times, six takeaways from Liz Cheney's book. You you were in the room for, for some of this. And I think it's worth reminding people um, that you know, how amazing it is that these indictments are coming from people like you and Liz Cheney, who were very conservative Republicans, who never yeah. would have been on anybody's <laughs> list for who are going to be the renegades necessarily. I mean, this is right. Liz Cheney. She is the daughter of former Vice President Dick Cheney. But um, this description about when she's criticizing Trump, the men in the room did not like her tone, thought she was not contrite yeah. enough for breaking with the party and effectively embarrassing them and putting them on the spot for questions about why they still supported yeah the former president who had tried to uh, over overthrow the the election. You, you've just got such a defiant attitude, Representative Ralph Norman of South Carolina told her. Representative John Rutherford of Florida said she was too recalcitrant and not riding for the brand. John, she writes that she replied, um, our brand is the U.S. Constitution. But this is my favorite part. Representative Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania made a memorable analogy in describing how betrayed he felt. It's like you're playing in the biggest game of your life and you look up and you see your girlfriend sitting on the opponent's side, he complained. Several astonished women in the conference started yelling, she's not your girlfriend. Miss Cheney agreed. Yeah, she said, I'm not your girlfriend. Dude, I I was there for all of this. Yeah. It just, that's the, it's, it's 100% accurate. So let me set the scene. So we're in what's called the CVC, the Congressional Visitor Center. Mm. And it's basically like all the members of Congress, you know, the Mm. Republican members, right? And everybody goes up to the microphones and they can speak. And Liz is up there with all the leadership. And it's just like this kind of, you know, hour long bitching session. So, or actually it's about two hours. So everybody goes up and there's people like me who I actually, I went a little off the handle that day. I, I, Mm. I, 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 I went a little too far and basically calling everybody cowards, but I was, I was furious. And then folks would go up and exactly as she described, there was this demand, this desire to say, we don't need Liz to, we don't need her to admit that Donald Trump's a great president. But as long as she says like, I get it, I made a mistake in some version, all they were looking for, they didn't understand it. They were just looking for something to soothe their own conscience. Yeah. Because if the person that is making them feel guilty, right. yeah. yeah yeah. If the person making them feel guilty says, I did something wrong, then you can sue. So so we're sitting there. And so Mike Kelly, remind me to tell you about Gallagher if I forget. So Mike Ooh. Kelly is, he's always this guy. He was a former coach or something, and he was a car salesman. And so he'd always give up and give these what he thought were rousing speeches to the conference. Like, you know, it would end in some crescendo like a Baptist pastor. 
And he thought like he would always compel people and everybody made fun of him behind his back, like that he would go give these speeches. <laughs> so he stands up and gives this speech about Liz and he's yelling, you know, you look over on the other side and your <laughs> girlfriend's with the opposing team. And we're all like, what? Like, you know, I get it. We're all for wow. analogies and fun things, but yeah. that was way over the top. And so he, he really spanked him. Mike Gallagher. So it was right about this time frame mm. when I remember seeing Mike Gallagher in the speaker's lobby, which is just basically kind of behind where you see the speaker sitting. And it's like a hallway. And I said, you know, dude, I saw on some Wisconsin thing where you said, basically, it's time to move on from Liz Cheney. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and I was shocked because to this point, Gallagher, that is he, shocking. he was, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. was going to vote to impeach Donald Trump. He was he was mm -hmm. on my list. Right, right. He made a last minute decision not to. So anyway, I was surprised then that not only that he didn't impeach, but that he was turning against Liz because they're both security hawks, supposedly. And he just goes, well, Adam, don't you think it's time that we heal as a party and we've got to quit kind of attacking each other? And she's just doing it too much in the public. And I was just like, Mike, like, dude, are you kidding me? But that. That it's a bit amazing to watch his transition, especially Mike Gallagher, because I thought far better of him. Well, and he was, uh, you know, as a as a fellow Wisconsinite, uh, you know, when when he when he emerged, um, uh, he really was sort of touted as the next Paul Ryan, as a real rising yeah. star. And you know, he may have a future, but he's made a future, um, you know, by by backing off on a lot <laughs> of all this. Okay, so speaking of your list, the impeachment list, before we move on to other things. Um, I want to get your thoughts about, I know you must know him very, very well, Pete, you know where yeah. I'm going on this, Peter Meyer, um, yeah. who actually did vote to impeach Donald Trump, lost his seat as a result of that. It was kind of an act of courage and has been decompensating since then. He's now running for Senate in um, in Michigan as a Republican and had this trying to sort of straddle and say he doesn't regret voting to impeach Donald Trump, but saying that if Donald Trump is the nominee, he will vote for him to become president again What's going on there? I, you know, this one, I'll be honest, this one has surprised me yeah. more than probably anything. Because after Peter Meyer voted to impeach, I was very public about that he, to me, was the most courageous because yeah. he was a freshman that made the decision. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, look, it's, I, I don't know if it's boredom, if it's being out of, you know, look, I had the advantage of I was in the public eye and I was in Congress for 12 years. So when I walked away, mm -hmm. you know, I had a pretty fulsome career behind me. He had two years. Mm -hmm. But I, I to, to take the courageous vote that he did, yeah. you have to have gone to the point of saying that no political career is worth my soul. And to watch what's happening, look, even outside of the principles of it, the raw political scientist, and, and Meyer's a good political scientist, he's got to understand that if you're going to run in a Republican primary, you either have to be all in for Donald Trump. Or right. you have to be all out. And maybe you right. can't win all out. I think someday you can win as all out. So this is why I don't understand. Why didn't he wait two years, four years? He's young. Nobody's going to forget him. Anybody that voted to impeach Trump, if you run for office again, you're not going to have been forgotten. Um, I don't get this, Charlie. And, 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 you know, he was a friend of mine. I guess I would still call him a friend, except that I... I mean, part of my friendship is based on this honor that I thought he had. And I just don't get this. I, I can't no, I can't put my arms around it. it. It just feels like such a familiar story, but it's still it is still shocking. OK, so big development of the week politically, uh, the Koch Network uh, endorsing Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, who is still way, way, way behind Donald Trump um, stipulation. She's unlikely to get the nomination. I mean, the, I think the Republican Party has made it very clear that they are Trump's party. But uh, what are, what is your take of this? Is uh, Nick, Nikki Haley last woman standing? Is it starting to consolidate? What do you I think it's at this point? I think it's consolidating to three. Uh, yeah. It's it's Trump. It's Haley. It's Christie. I, I I personally like Chris Christie. I know you do too. Mm -hmm. And I think he needs to stay through New Hampshire. I mean, I, I really do. Yeah. I get it that. You know, New Hampshire is a shot. But I think, honestly, let's say Chris Christie gets out at New Hampshire. Haley comes in second anyway. Or let's yeah. say she even barely wins. I don't know if that's going to propel her to the presidency. Yeah. Uh, just as much as, like, I think if Chris Christie can win New Hampshire, I think that's going to be effective for him. And we need his voice out there. I've heard you've been saying. I agree. I've heard yeah. you saying well, that. We I need mean, his voice. Yeah. Because Haley's not, I mean, look, I, I like Nikki Haley. I do. And I would just, I would give all of my money for her to be the nominee versus mm -hmm. Donald Trump. But she's not out there telling the truth. So, right. yeah, there's this consolidation happening. Um, 
I, I'm for it. I'm supportive of it. I really think, though, you're not going to see any leap of anything until potentially if Donald Trump goes to trial in, in March, I guess, what is it, early mm-hmm. March, and you start mm-hmm. seeing the evidence for this and people start realizing he's completely on board, then I think Chris Christie has a case because if they're in, and it's 1% mm-hmm. chance, I'll grant you this, yeah. but if, if there's a chance that people, you know, it's like Saturday morning after your Friday night bender, you kind of look around and you're like, what the hell did we do last night? If the party is that after seeing this evidence of Donald Trump come forward, Chris Christie's in the best position to benefit from that because Chris Christie can say, see guys, I've been telling you, I've been accurate. Now, Granted, is there, ch- you know, what are the chances that the party wakes up like a Saturday morning? Probably not high, but I think he's got a point to make. And, but well, yeah. I, I do think the good thing, at least, is it is consolidating. And I am pleased beyond pleased that Vivek Ramaswamy is just collapsing. Yeah, no, his uh, his his bubble burst pretty quickly. See, I, I, I think that this leads to, to something I wanted to talk to you about that, um, you know, we can we can parse through, you know, what what Coke is doing and why they're doing it, what Nikki Haley's, you know, um, you know, you know, trajectory is. I, I think at a certain point we do need to step back from sort of the horse horse race punditry and the game theory and recognize, OK, if if a Donald Trump presidency represents an existential threat to democracy, maybe we ought to treat it that way. Right. Um, maybe we ought to, uh, you know, set set aside the cynicism and the doom gloom and the Eeyore stuff and say, OK, what is it going to take to stop him? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that, look, it's going to take another Republican uh, to, to, to to slow him down. I don't think it's going to happen necessarily. <laughs> but, you know, there we go into 2024. You're going to have uh, you're going to have these Republican voices out there. Um, well, we can talk about who they're going to be. Liz Cheney, you, Chris Christie members of the Trump administration, his former secretary of defense, his former uh, his former attorney general, his former you know national security advisor, his former chiefs of, of staff. This is the world that you live in all the time. Why hasn't this been more effective in breaking off Republicans? It's one thing for Democrats, CNN, MSNBC, the Huffington Post to say that Donald Trump is a menace. But this voice is coming from inside the room. Your voice is coming inside the room. Liz Cheney, you know, has a lifetime of credibility built up, and yet there is this resistance. So, well, it's are, we, interesting. Are, we, are we just back to the fact that Republicans have become I, a cult as, as opposed to a political party? What else? Well, I think there's definitely some of that. I think, look, you know, the number of people that have, and doing a book tour is fun because you get to go out and no. meet all kinds of different people. And what I've noticed is there are a lot of people that were Republicans that have become kind of hesitant Democrats in this moment. The problem is, is Donald Trump has convinced a lot of Democrats to become Republicans in this moment as well. So while it feels like the base hasn't shifted, there have been movements like, you know, the suburban uh, Republicans or yeah. whatever. But I think the other thing, Charlie, look, in, in a cult type environment, you know, I grew up in a really conservative Baptist church, independent fundamental Baptist, which I would consider cultish, honestly. And mm-hmm. what happens is when you exclude yourself or you go outside of these like predetermined parameters, yeah, you yeah. get isolated, you get <clears> pushed aside. And that's what the party does really well to me, to Liz Cheney. They say, I mean, all you got to do is look at Twitter and it's like, Adam Kinzinger is a Republican laughable. He's not a Republican, right? He's, he's a Democrat or he's an, he's a CNN guy, whatever. And that's what you can do. You, it's fine. You can try to minimize me all you want. And the problem is now we've gotten to the point at the very beginning of Donald Trump, you know, people would go along with him because they didn't want to get tweeted at, or they didn't want, you know, whatever the the consequences were now though, they have given so much, they have compromised so much of themselves that to admit that Donald Trump is unqualified or completely unfit for office, you now have to admit that for six or seven years, and this isn't just elected officials, this is people that vote for him. You have to admit that for six or seven years, you looked aside a morally corrupt person and you supported him. You have to admit that everything you did to enable him was wrong. And it's much easier, Charlie, instead of facing that, it's much easier to retreat to the safety of your tribe where your tribe puts their arm around you and says, you're safe here. You don't have to come face to face with what you did. Instead, just understand as long as we're owning the libs, we're in this together. And people like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney and Charlie Sykes, they make you feel bad, not because you deserve it, because they're bad. So I'm increasingly, I, I think it's increasingly obvious that 2024 
is very different than 2016 and 2020 in the sense that there, there are no longer any illusions about who Donald Trump is, whether he will grow into the office, whether he will be more presidential, or that Trump 2.0 will be anything like Trump 1.0. Um, uh, you and I have discussed this. Robert Kagan has this very long piece in the Washington Post where he goes through, you know, what Trump is saying he will do in his second term, who he will go after, who he will punish. And then he raises the question, and who's going to stop him? Who's going to stand against him? Is it going to be the criminal justice system? Is it going to be Congress? Is it going to be the media? Is it going to be the public? Are Republicans going to? And his main point is Donald Trump has made it clear you know, how he wants to weaponize the office of the presidency, make it into this this instrument, this this cudgel of retribution, and that there are very few restraints, very few constraints that will limit him. And I'm not sure that everybody has fully taken on board. I mean, I think because there's the same old, same old, but when you sort of run through what Donald Trump is saying he's going to do, and then watch the way he's preparing. I mean, there's a piece in Axios where it talks about how they are already vetting people for the administration. They want to make sure that there are no normies in this administration. They're not so concerned about credentials. They want to know that you've been red pilled and that you and and that you follow Tucker Carlson, that you are a true believer in all of this bullshit. And these are the people who are going to have the lover lovers of power. So it's not, you know, the second chapter of Trump 1.0. And so, so talk to me about how alarmed, I mean, I, I, I wrote a piece saying we're not sufficiently alarmed because I think there's still this assumption that something's going to come along, the magical thing is going to stop it, or that there are going to be these bulwarks and these guardrails that are still going to protect us. And if he gets back into office, I just don't think that's true anymore. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you. And and I think when we think of the the guardrails of democracy, like mm -hmm. they're not static objects, they're, you know, to quote Mitt Romney, it's people, man, you know, they're people. And so, you know, a guardrail of democracy is a attorney general that believes in the constitution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, maybe some constitutional scholar knows this better than me, but from what I understand, there really is nothing constitutionally that prevents a president from putting a completely partisan attorney general in to right. do completely partisan things. There's nothing. Right. The only thing that stopped that is our like kind of compact among Americans that we're not going to do that, that justice needs to be fair. Um, so I guarantee you when Donald Trump gets in, he's going to, he'll, he'll, he'll interview five people and look for the first guy that tells him, I don't give a rat's ass about the constitution. I'll do whatever you want. And right. trust me, it's not going to be hard to find that person. I mean, look at Jeffrey Clark, for instance, and this was back before it was even cool to be against the constitution. And so all those guardrails will be gone because they are working on this. Now you may think Donald Trump is dumb and maybe he is, but he's got a lot of really smart people around him that have a plan. And so I say this to my democratic friends because it's, I almost said like not to scare you. Yes. To scare you because this is a very real possibility. And if you think, Look, the courts have been stellar so far in protecting this. So but far. you think that, like, you know, a Supreme Court, for instance, and I'm not trying to, to take a dump on the Supreme Court. I like no. the Supreme Court. Yeah. But let's say they come out with a rule against Donald Trump and he says, no, who, how are you going to enforce it? You can't do it. This is a serious issue. And I say this to all of the scoffers sometimes in the crowd when I get asked, you know, about issues. And it's like, well, how do you feel about this issue or that issue? And I give a Republican position because I'm still a, con a moderate conservative and they scoff like we've never could be in the same camp. OK, but if you think that you're going to grow to 51 percent to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president, actually probably 54 yeah. percent without people like me, you are incorrect. Well, I think that's true. By the way, just to, this is a like a, almost a footnote to what you were just saying here. And this is from the Robert Kagan article, which is something that never He's really great, occurred by to the me. way. Yeah, this yeah. is a really important piece. So it talks about. OK, um, you know, what might be motivating Donald Trump, including a desire for reelection? Of course, he can't run for reelection. Right. If he was if he was elected, if he couldn't go for a third term. He writes, Trump might not want or need a third term. But were he to decide that he wanted one, as he sometimes has indicated, would the 22nd Amendment block him any more effectively from being president for life than the Supreme Court if he refused to be blocked? Why would anyone think that an amendment would be more sacrosanct than any other part of the Constitution for a man like Trump or more importantly, for his devoted supporters? So this is the if, if you if you think you have the worst case scenario out there yeah. um, again, once we've learned how much of the Constitution and all of our norms are based on the honor system. That's right. And really, who's going to in 
Who's going to enforce them? Would a Republican Senate actually stand up against him? We just don't know. Would a Republican yeah. Senate refuse to cons- confirm that attorney general? I'm skeptical. Hey, can I say something yeah. controversial yeah. that's not controversial, but it sounds it is. So like I get asked all the time, you know, why did you make the decision, obviously, yeah. to impeach in January 6th and all that? And I go, look, I represented 700,000 people and I didn't take an oath to any of them. None of them, none of those 700, if every one of the people I represented in Northern Illinois had called me on the phone and said, vote against impeachment, I am under no obligation to do what they say, because the oath I took was to the constitution of the United States, not to my district, not to the people I represent. And the problem is we are allowing people to get into office skating by on taking the oath perfunctory. When the oath is all is the only thing, and that commitment to the oath is the only thing that holds self-governance together. And that's what, frankly, in 2024, I'm telling people, like, I don't care, like, guns, nothing, none of that's on the ballot. The only thing on the ballot is democracy. And so find the people that believe in the oath and don't worry about any of the other policies because we'll debate those for the next hundred years anyway. Okay, so I, I, I'm I'm squishy on this particular issue. Okay, I I have I have not gone as far as uh, some of my colleagues, including Bill Crystal, on the whole you know Biden question. But among the alarming articles I link to in my newsletter, this Pamela uh, is the Pamela Paul piece in the New York Times, where she goes through again the authoritarian threat and said you know that you know Trump is saying the gloves are off that you know what he's going to do as president. She writes, still the Democrats act as if everything is normal. They talk yes. about why to support Joe Biden's campaign for re-election, that he's done a pretty good job, they say. He led the country out of the pandemic, avoided yeah. a deep recession. True. He beat all other primary yeah. candidates last time, and he beat Trump before. We should go with a proven contender. But she goes on to say, <laughs> but even if Biden has done a pretty good job as president, most Americans do yeah. not see that. His approval ratings have just hit a new low. Biden may want another turn. <laughs> But term, but the obvious, if unchivalrous response is so what? Not every person, whether young or elderly, wants what is in his own best interest, let alone in the interest of a nation. And then she finishes here. Democrats cannot afford to take a version of the it's Bob Dole's turn approach this time around. That's kind of a gut punch because I actually did have that flashback to. Why did Republicans think it was a good idea to put an elderly Bob Dole up against Bill Clinton in 1996? Well, it was his turn. What do you think, Adam Kinzinger? Look, and you know what's interesting is I was a rebellious kid in 96, but I voted for, <laughs> I think, Ross Perot just because mm-hmm. I'm like, I was a Republican, but I'm like, ah, Bob Dole. I mean, in yeah. hindsight, I love Bob Dole, but same yeah. thing. And you could see that. Look, I think it's really dangerous because, you know, look, yes. Biden has accomplished a lot. I'm still confused because when he ran, I thought he made it pretty clear he was just yeah. running one term. It's kind of the, that, that implication. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the only fa- I think the reality of this is he is running because the alternative will be Kamala. And I think Kamala is guaranteed to lose. And so I think that's the Demo- that's the <clears throat> danger that the Democrats are in. I think that's their quandary that they can't say out loud. But look, and I said this at an event I was at last night. I'm like, you guys, you know, you Democrats out in the audience, like you may not believe that immigration is an issue. Yeah. You may scoff when I talk about crime. You may want to pretend like Biden didn't just have his 81st birthday and not put out a single press release about it. That's fine. You can do that. But I'm telling you, the people that are going to vote are talking about this. Yeah. And you have to meet them where they are or you can pretend like and be surprised in 2016 when, you know, Donald Trump wins. I mean, that's the reality of where we are. And this Israel yeah. thing is a huge problem. And the Democrats have got to get a grip on this. No, I, I agree with you completely. I, mean, I wrote about immigration, the, the, the border problem uh, earlier this week. Uh, Rui, Rui Teixeira has a great post about uh, you know, what Democrats need to do on crime. But let's talk about the, the other big elephant in the room right now. And you're out there talking to people. Um, you have some strong thoughts about what's going on with, with Israel, with Hamas. Yeah. Um, this divide on the left is very real, and I am increasingly concerned that it is it is durable, that people's passions have been aroused. And so give me your sense of, of how the political fallout from the Biden administration's support for Israel I'm just going to throw it out there where we want well, to go on this one. Look, I, I, in 2015, I was on the, uh, around, you know, kind of again, mid my mid career. Um, I was on the foreign affairs committee with a guy named Dana Rohrbacher Dark and Dana Rohrbacher. Yeah. yeah nuts. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, he was about, he was very pro-Putin. And he was the only Republican that was pro-Putin. And I would yeah, get into yeah. literally yelling matches with yeah. him on the committee. And people would go up and be like, oh, Adam, don't worry about Dana. He's kind of a one-off. We all thought he yeah. was on the KGB payroll anyway. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. uh, and now a great over 50% of my party is pro-Putin. Yeah. Like, that happened. That happened. I was the only one taking on Dana and calling mm -hmm. this insane. The rest of them just like, oh, it's going to go away. So to my Democratic friends, first off, if you think this pro-Hamas wing, this pro, you know, sure, maybe it's just pro-Palestinian. I don't know. Whatever it is, whatever you, if you think this isn't the, this isn't a big deal, uh, you're hanging out in the wrong circles. Like you need to see that this is a big deal. And I'll tell you, Charlie, again, on my book tour, this is the beauty, the beauty of a book tour. Mm -hmm. When I, cause I get asked about Israel and every, yeah. and every, you know, thing. And I said, well, first off, Hamas needs to be utterly completely destroyed. It is amazing to watch about half of the audience sit on their hands for that very basic statement. All I said is Hamas needs destroyed. I didn't say, mm -hmm. and I even preempt it with like, we care about Palestinian lives, but Hamas needs destroyed. Sit on their hands. Hamas is ISIS. I mean, it's yeah. even almost in some cases worse than ISIS. Democrats have a real issue. And when the White House has to put out a, a statement by the president that says, on the one hand, Israel should be able to destroy Hamas. On the other hand, Israel should not resume the war. And you see that they're trying to have it both ways. I'm sorry. If you have to rely on the pro Hamas kind of wing of the Democratic Party to hold your coalition together, that is a pretty tough coalition to hold together. And it's really problematic and it's very concerning. Okay, I, I have to admit, I'm a little confused here because you know, on one screen, it looks as if Joe Biden has been firmly in support of Israel. I mean, he went there, he embraced Netanyahu. Um, his the, the policy has been very clear anti Hamas. On the other hand, you also, on this other screen, though, I, I get the sense that Democrats are kind of looking over their shoulder. They're seeing that they have a problem with young voters, with, with the left wing, with the Arab American voters. And then we had that tweet, I think we were referring to earlier this week, which was, I, I think the, the best thing I can say about it is it was ambiguous. It seemed right. to be That's... implying that we should just stop everything. It was a ceasefire. The Biden White House you know, came out and afterwards and said, no, 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 there's no change in policy. This was just a you know, badly done excerpt from from a speech. But I guess this seems to me to be the worst possible moment to go squishy on this issue, particularly yeah. if 2024 is going to be this test between the strong man and the weak old vacillating man. So uh, what, what is your sense? No, that's true. And and like this is the moment, you know, and I, I'm frankly, I'm not a huge Netanyahu fan, obviously, but I'm no. I'm. Glad that the other day he came out and said, look, we made it clear we're going to eliminate Hamas. We're going to eliminate Hamas. And, and I think the United States has to take into account, OK, if that is Israel's stated goal and they're going to actually do it, every day of a ceasefire extends the war, not just a day. It extends it months because uh, Hamas right now is able to better dig yeah. in. They're able to resupply. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a huge it's a huge problem. And so I think he's appearing weak on this. I think he needs to like. Just say we're, we back Israel in, in finishing and protecting themselves. If he, I think the president would be benefited by going out and giving a televised speech or something somewhere and saying, do you guys remember what happened on October 7th? Let me remind you of what October 7th was. You know, I, we've said before, you know, the, the Nazis, as terrible as they were, obviously incredibly mm -hmm. awful, they didn't videotape with glee their crimes. Hamas videotaped with glee their crimes. And so I think that they're making a danger. The other quick thing I want to say too is Biden has, it sounds awesome to say it is like America will do anything to get its people back. That is a commitment, by the way, that we should have for the American military. And we do. Mm -hmm. And the point is we're going to invest in rescue assets and everything else. But when you start saying we will do anything to get every American back, we're going to trade the worst arms dealer for Brittany Griner. We're going to give $6 billion in theory to Iran for these five hostages. Uh, and we're going to, we're upset because, you know, only one American was released and there's other Americans. So we're going to encourage Israel to extend the ceasefire so that we get more Americans. You know, Hamas knows that. And the reason they're not releasing Americans is because they want the U.S. to continue to pressure Israel to not resume the fight. Like we need to be a country that's recommitted to doing anything to get our citizens out except negotiate with terrorists. We can't do that.
No, and of course, uh, you know what? The, what does that lead to? It leads to uh, more hostages. I, I just think there needs to be more clarity about who Hamas yeah. is, um, what Hamas is. That Hamas does not believe in a two-state solution. Hamas does not believe in the peace process. Hamas is committed to wiping out um, to wiping out uh, Jews and and the state of Israel. Um, you mentioned uh, Netanyahu before. Uh, we had this report in the New York Times, I believe it was today that suggests that that Israeli intelligence actually had a detailed memo of the Hamas plan uh, to nice. uh, to you know, te- launch these terror attacks. And it decided what it wasn't going to happen. I don't know how Netanyahu even keeps his job at this point. The the level of failure. There's another report, yeah. which I'm sure you, you've seen of a, of a speech that the Hamas leader had given some time ago where he made it very, very clear that we are coming for you. There's going to be the flood. We are going to be murdering men, women, and children. And we're going to be doing it again. There's nothing subtle about this. There's no gray area. And I I, th- I think to the, to the extent that the administration has to deal with this, they need to keep hammering on the point. This is who Hamas is. Yeah. Hamas is ISIS. Maybe Hamas is even worse than ISIS. There can be no compromise. There is no coexistence with ISIS. I don't remember any pro-ISIS demonstrations. I don't remember people taking to the streets to say, you know, we need a ceasefire in Mosul, you know, that we cannot go after them. This just didn't happen. So th- this is part of the mind-exploding moment that we find ourselves in. Yeah, it is. And, and if you think of Mosul, I mean, we basically destroyed the city to save it. I mean, that's a yeah. fact, right? We we being, well, some of us, and then also with the Iraqi yeah. military, uh, decided to level the city to save it from mm. ISIS. And it worked. Yeah. It sucks, but it worked. And yeah, and I think, I, I yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there needs to be that clarity. And Netanyahu will, I think he's going to have to face his, his, he'll have to face his comeuppance. I mean, the reality is I've heard rumors. So I, again, it's just rumors to so take this, but that the, basically the Hamas, kind of IDF was pulled to deal with these West Bank settler issues. And that's why you had yeah. such open holes. And if that's the case, I mean, yeah, he's, he's certainly going to pay a heavy price. So I guess one, one last uh, qu- question going into 2024, I mean, 20, you know, we're, we're in December of yeah. 2023. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, part of the, you know, this moment is to think, you know, <laughs> what are we going to be thinking and knowing a year from now, December 1st, 2024 because it is going to be a hell of a year i mean it's going to be the trials it's going yeah. to be the election it's going to be the conventions it's going to be the possibility of a convicted felon uh being elected president of the united states uh we have the possibility of uh, multiple impeachments by the way do you think your former colleagues in the house will impeach joe biden can they help themselves no they can't help themselves i, I think the pressure is going to be too great um now there's some mobster boss that's testifying against joe biden i don't know what the latest is uh, I think I think they have to do it because and I've I've said this from the I'm just yeah. surprised they didn't do it every month, but they will have. See, this is the kind of the weird thing looking at it from the other point of view, because I'm thinking that if there's one thing that will solidify uh, Democratic support for Biden and maybe turn things around, it would be impeachment. I mean, this is one of those things where I think that for a long time we all thought that if you impeach somebody, that would be the political death knell. Actually, this may be the one thing that will uh, focus the minds of, of Democrats on all of this. The other question is whether or not they will have enough of a margin. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, as you and I are speaking, we don't know about the George Santos thing. Right. Right. But um, what do you make of these rumors that Kevin McCarthy may resign? Um, oh, I, they may I actually think it's be gotta, leaving. I think he is. I think he's good. Well, I mean, who knows? But that's kind like, of an FU. I mean, because th- th- they don't have a lot of votes to give. No, nope, right. No, nope. but he's got he's bitter. I mean, he's obviously he's really bitter. And I think he decided to stick around for a while. I I had heard that he actually wasn't getting quite the job offers he thought he would. And that kind of happens when you tie yourself to Trump. You become unemployable. Um, and so, uh, you know, but I think I think it's true that he ends up going because he's got to be miserable every day faced with he is not speaker. He is not speaker. That's a huge damage to his ego. And uh, yeah, I think he's I think he's going to be gone. No, I mean, he has, to go, he has year. to go to work every day in the scene of his ultimate humiliation. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it couldn't have absolutely. happened to a nicer guy. No, but, I know. You know I, I this, cry this, for this, him nightly. Yeah, I mean, and and a lot of these guys, you know, have to walk in there, Steve Scalise, and go, okay, I got humiliated, but now, you know, I have to, you know, find a way to 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 suck it up. Uh, obviously, um, 
people really, really like that kind of power. So, Adam, could you just remind people that there, in fact, is life after Congress? Oh, listen. You don't go away. You don't dry up. And it just what? That's, you know, the biggest thing is like you, your fear as a per, as a congressman is like the second I announce I'm not running again, I'm going to regret it. But the announcement's mm-hmm. already out. That's literally, you mm-hmm. talked to any of them. That's their biggest fear. There is life after. It is, it is awesome. Yeah. I mean, if you still, everybody's like, well, how do you still be relevant? Obviously I'm still out there. I personally, if I lost relevancy and went away, it'd be fine. Trust me. I, I, mm-hmm. I would be okay with it. I've lived, you know, enough of a political life, but um, but there are ways to stay out there. Yes. It's, listen, your soul, your soul and your, your place in history is not worth another two years at the job. The job kind of sucks, to be honest with you. It's just not worth it. And you don't have to call and suck up to, to donors. Uh, the book no. is Renegade. I'm holding this up for, for our YouTube viewers. Uh, Renegade, Defending Democracy and Liberty in Our Divided Country. Adam Kinzinger, New York Times bestseller. Adam, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Yeah, you bet. It was good to be with you. And thank you all for listening to the weekend edition of the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we will do this all over again.